Uh, right, uh, everybody, nice to see you all here. Um, so I'm Michael Jacobson. I've, uh, I, I'm a research scientist here at the MIT Game Lab, and uh, I'm conducting a study on co-op games. That's sort of a, an umbrella study with several different components, looking at everything from uh, uh, the different interaction modes existing in co-op games and whether there are uh, areas to explore design-wise that there are previously unexplored where we could find interesting mechanics and interactions to uh, critically studying how game developers think about this player two person that's coming into the gameplay experience when uh, you make co-op games rather than single player games. Uh, so what I wanted to do here today is talk a little bit about co-op games and why I think they are interesting. Uh, we'll take a little uh, trip to uh, the gaming arcades and see what has been happening there uh, through the years in terms of uh, co-op games. And then I also would like to say a little bit about what I think would be interesting to explore from a design perspective uh, when it comes to making any type of co-op game, including uh, arcade games, and also what maybe be a little uh, weary and uh, uh, thoughtful of in that process. Okay, so to begin with, what is a co-op game? Well. Uh, maybe the most popular co-op games currently are, for instance, uh, MMO games or, or MOBAs. And they also have a co-op element, although they are uh, a team versus team kind of operation. But uh, uh, I think usually when we talk about co-op games, this isn't the first type of game we think of, because we think of these as PvE or team versus team or something like that. So when we say co-op, maybe it's uh, this that we think of, couch co-op games, uh, that, that you play together in, in the same room. I think that online co-op games, and of course many games on consoles, for instance, are both online and local co-op. I think online co-op games are great. Uh, there's, uh, for instance, I, I've been playing a lot of shooters on the Xbox 360, everything from Left 4 Dead to Halo, Gears of War, Resident Evil, Earth, Force Defense, Earth Defense Force, and so on, that I don't really think would be much fun at all if it wasn't for the fact that I was playing together with someone else and it's that interaction between the players that I find really enjoyable in those games. And sometimes you don't have someone uh, locally in your living room to play with, so then you have to go online to, to have those kinds of experiences. I do, however, think that there are certain qualities in co-op gaming that only exist locally when you are, if not face to face, so at least like face by face or something like that, uh, in a couch or maybe doing something like this. This is also a, a co-op gaming experience we have a lot of music games, we have the rock band games, we have Sing Star, we have the Dance Central and so on that all have co-op modes in them at least. So it doesn't really have to be in the couch even if we call it, often call it couch co-op. Um, and it can also be this. Uh, Co-op board games have gotten a lot of traction the last couple of years. They used to be very few and far between. Uh, but nowadays, if you look at board gaming hobbyists making their top 10 lists of last year or the year before, you're going to see uh, three or four co-op games in there. So something has, uh, has definitely happened there. Also, props to these guys who are playing Arkham Horror with all the expansions at the same time. Uh, so, uh, I also look at, at board games uh, and other type of uh, 
co-op gameplay and not just video games, but, but I'll be mostly focusing on, on video games in the presentation here today. Uh, some of the, the things that I find interesting with co-op games is that they, they have some unique properties that I think are promising in making gaming more inclusive. For instance, you don't have to set up this uh, antagonistic relationship between the players. Some people actually don't like this or I'm gonna kill you kind of uh, relation to the person that they're playing with. So there's a sort of a natural deselection of potential players when you create this versus uh, engagement between players. Uh, uh, also, there's a different type of interaction going on between the players. For instance, um, if you're playing a puzzle solving game uh, and it's made into a co-op game, we've known for a long time that problem solving is best done in, in small teams. So uh, a, a pair of people engaging with a, an issue where you sort of have to think outside of the box uh, can be very good because when where one person gets stuck and just can't think of the solution, the other person might not get stuck and so on. So you can sort of feed off each other and have a very interesting person-to-person -person interaction in those types of games, even if maybe the gameplay itself doesn't have that much direct engagement between the characters on the screen. Um, I think uh, it's interesting to study co-op gaming as well because we have all these different interactions going on. We have the characters that, that interact with each other on the screen, we have the players that interact with their characters on their screen, but then we also have the interaction between the, the players in the room. So for someone who is interested in interaction design, this is sort of very rich material to, to, to dig in. Uh, okay, so uh, co-op gaming can also be this. I don't know, do we have anyone here who is familiar with fire truck? Oh. know about it when I was, we, we did a little field study uh, at Funspot, which is this great game arcade slash arcade museum up in New Hampshire uh, that has more vintage arcade machines than any other place in the world. And they do have fire truck, but I mean, so fire truck is interesting for, for several, several reasons. Uh, uh, for one, it's a very early co-op arcade game. It's from uh, 1978 and was made by Atari. Uh, but it's not just co-op, it's also uh, that the, 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 the two players are actually doing different activities in the game, which was very unusual in early co-op arcade games. Usually it was more of a palette swap situation, so uh, you had blue guy, but then you also had red guy, and they both did more or less the same thing. They were using the same sprite, usually. Um, but here, we're driving a fire truck, and one person is in front, uh, driving the front of the truck, and then the other person is, is steering the, the back wheels of the, the ladder, ladder part of, of, of the truck. And um, uh, it's also enforced co-op, so in some co-op games, you sort of say you're shooting aliens. Uh, one person might decide not to shoot any aliens and the person, other person can still go through and shoot all the aliens themselves. But here you need to re you rely on collaboration since you're steering the same vehicle. So if someone decides to do badly, you, you will both do badly. Also, it helps. It, it doesn't really impact the gameplay, but, but it, it has a horn and it has a bell that you can ring or honk, which I think is awesome. Uh, so, multiplayer gaming 
we, we, I think we had pretty much from, from day one in, in, in video games because uh, it's, it's just, I think, the easiest solution to a technical problem. Uh, if you want to have uh, some adversarial component in a game, uh, it's harder to make an AI character that you're fighting against than to just make two players fight each other. So it, it's sort of a little bit of a Wizard of Oz kind of scenario where you, if you can't put everything in the code, you use human brains and human activities to make up for some of that to still make make a full experience out of it. So, for instance, a, a very early game Space War that was made here uh, had two player capabilities but not collaboration. And uh, excuse me. So it, it took it took so the Space War was early sixties, it took to the seventies before we started seeing co op games. Um, and even towards the, the end of the 70s. But uh, then, as I found out from, uh, from my, my uh, fun spot excursion, then things started happening uh, within co-op games. Um, this is the, a list of, of uh, games I saw or games I were playing uh, uh, at fun spot. And if we look at the, the years that they were released, we, we see that there's really this uh, uh, bunch of, of games coming out mid to late 80s. So there was, there was a lot of co-op games in the arcades around that period. So, so if we talk about the the golden age of the arcade being uh, early 80s maybe, then there was sort of this second wave of type of arcade game experiences where they, they had a co-op rather than just versus or single player gaming. And if we, if we look at what type of games these are, uh, we can see that we have uh, the the vertical is scrolling shooters like uh, uh, 1942, for instance, where, where you fly planes and you shoot whatever comes in your way, drop some bombs and so on. So that's pretty easy to, to add a, a second player that has their own plane uh, and drop some bombs as well. Uh, we have the, the top down hack and slash, which I was a fan of myself. Gauntlet and its, it's follow-ups and uh, different versions of so basically you there they they made it a little more advanced you you have different roles depending on which color character you were so you could be the wizard or you could be the warrior and so on and and uh, well the warrior would have to uh, do the the fighting while the the wizard tried to sort of stand back and shoot. Spells uh, at the enemies and so on. So, so there it, it sort of had this division of labor in two different roles and trying to complement your each other's play styles. Um, then we had the side scrolling beat them ups or side scrolling run and guns like Contra, for instance, was very popular. Um, there you had some. You, you were different characters, but you and you could have different weapons, but you basically did the same time, same thing, and you weren't so dependent on, on each other in, in playing those games. And uh, then we also had some platformers, like the the first Mario Brothers games, was the call, for instance, and then we went to the consoles and became single player. Um, so. Fairly simple gameplay ideas when it comes to sort of the collaboration between players and the, the, the difference between the single player and the, the, the co-op experience. It's usually the same levels you're playing. You might get 
little more enemies if you're paying a call, but, but you're basically doing the same levels and uh, try to reach the same goals. You're just two people uh, doing it rather than one. So in a sense, the, the, the fire truck game was a little more uh, sort of advanced in its thinking about what co-op gaming experiences could be. Oh, and then uh, in the 90s, we, we saw a bunch of uh, light gun shooters uh, because that technology had, had sort of reached the arcades then, like time crisis and so on. And then they were often like you had one gun each and you could do some collaboration in terms of, uh, well, I'm, I have to reload, can you shoot now? And so, so you don't have to reload at the same time things like that, but, but, but still sort of the same experience for, for single and uh, two player teams. Uh, as a side note, uh, or somewhere in, in the 90s there was sort of this divergent be divergence between Western and Japanese gaming arcades where uh, they sort of took a different route. They uh, they are still out there and they are doing a lot of co-op gaming, but in, in in different ways than than, uh, than this and uh, something that I have less knowledge of, to be honest. Uh, but I in the West, the gaming arcade scene kind of started to die down there in the 90s, and there wasn't that much new developed in terms of co-op arcade experiences. So uh, I wanted to talk a bit uh, sort of general now about the the, uh, the, the co-op interaction experience. So uh, I, I mentioned before that we have these different levels of interaction. Uh, by the way, they, they were playing a single player game, so I had to pop in another game to make it realistic. Go ahead. Uh, what, I, what this image adds is these happy, happy parents that just love th that their kids are, are playing that nation. Uh, th so we have, I wanted to sort of highlight the, the element of uh, spectatorship here as well. So uh, while uh, we have two people actively engaging with the game, there is sort of a, a sliding scale of spectatorship going on as well. Because I think one thing that makes games in general uh, unique is that we can both act and spectate at the same time. That's hard to do if you're doing theater or playing music or something like that. But the fact that we have a representation of ourselves on the screen, so we can observe ourselves at the same time as we are controlling ourselves, gives sort of this duality to the mode of the experience. But that gets uh, sort of more and more complex the, the, the more people you add into it. So, so when you have co-op gaming experiences, there is also this element of sort of showmanship where you are acting in front of the audience of not just yourself but also someone else playing. And then there might be someone who isn't engaging as much with the game as you are. Sometimes the second player mode is someone who is doing more sort of routine activities, maybe someone who can't be killed someone who doesn't have as much agency in the game. So it sort of goes more to a semi-active spectator role. And then you have <coughs> spectators that are just watching what you're doing. Maybe your hot seat. Maybe the, the parents are ready to jump into the action here. But right now, they're just observing what's going on. So um, the in-game interaction can sometimes be designed to uh, have these elements of 
interaction between the characters. As I mentioned, that was very unusual in the earlier arcade games. But, but in sort of more modern code, they've been thinking more about what can the characters on screen actually do with each other. So here in Portal we have the robots high-fiving after having solved this difficult problem, I assume. Well, maybe the players are also high-fiving in the couch, and here we see the problem with three players go up that maybe sometimes the one gets left out of the high-fiving altogether. So we have all these different interactions going on um, that we have to think about as designers what it is we're trying to achieve. Um, and I wanted to sort of go on in two different strands here. The first one I wanted to talk about is uh, how collaborative games actually often have an element of adversarial play within them as well. Uh, one example of this would be uh, the GameCube game uh, Zelda Four Swords. Four Swords. I don't know if anyone has, here has played that game. A few, yes, but quite a lot. So, uh, uh, just any thoughts about that game? Did you like it or not, and why? Jenny? It's so easy to be a dick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's, that's something that often comes up pretty much the first thing when, when, when that game is discussed. It was not, it was not a, it was an interesting attempt at doing two screens at once, but I, I didn't play this very much, but I played Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles, which is the same conceit, right, to control everything on right. GBA. Uh, the, this screen, this screen, this screen, this screen, didn't just make me mad. Right, so yeah, it, it has that, which I think, uh, again, from an interaction design perspective, is very interesting that you could you could play it with just the regular controllers, but if you hooked up uh, a bunch of Game Boys, Game Boy Advances with, with link cables, uh, when you went inside a building, for instance, you would see the insights on your own screen, which meant that you had information that the other people didn't have that you were playing together with. I don't think. As interesting as that is, I don't think that was what was the core takeaway for many people about this gaming experience. Instead, I think it's a little bit like what we heard from back there, that uh, often you didn't really get that far in the game because it requires you to collaborate, but it, at the same time uh, gives you all these opportunities to be mean to each other. So. So yellow link can pick up green link and throw him off a cliff, or uh, people can try to steal each other's rupees and coins and so on. And at the end of each level, you get scored, and whoever had the most rupees sort of wins an award, whoever got the, the most gold wins an award. And there's one interesting one that where you get to vote on each other who was the best teammate. And that person also gets an award. And then you get sort of an overall who was the best player in the team. So, so it has built into the, the, the game itself this competition and not just collaboration. And when I talk to so-called hardcore gamers about this game, they often say that, well, we just got so frustrated that we had to stop playing. We didn't make it past level two because everybody was just being mean to each other as well. What I thought was interesting was that I didn't play this until uh, uh, later in life and together with uh, uh, some friends that were academics and sort of also a little older. And we never even thought about the idea of throwing each other off cliffs and so on. We were being very nice and polite to each other and you go first and don't you want some more heart or something like that. So it isn't just how the game is designed. Definitely the things you put in there, the sort of tools to collaborate or to uh, compete or be nice or mean to each other are gonna be used. But it's also a question of 
the mindset of the people who play and the chemistry between the players in the group, the setting of playing the game and so on. So uh, the same design can also lead to very different sort of uh, actual gameplay outcomes, uh, which makes it even more interesting. This is, of course, something that uh, game developers have uh, realized. And uh, this was a fairly early co-op game in, in the sort of, uh, evolution of console co-op gaming. So if you look at more recent games, you can see that developers, on one hand, tend to put in this sort of Chekhov's gun kind of opportunities to be mean to each other, but at the same time try to create an experience that pushes the players through it, whether there's someone who is sort of struggling going another direction or uh, trying to counteract the team effort and so on. So there's sort of this tidal wave that just drives you through the level while you are also allowed to do some uh, uh, sort of joshing between the players when it doesn't mean halting the gaming experience altogether. Um, I want to show a, a little clip. Uh, I had a Europe uh, last uh, academic year and we were playing some co-op games and uh, this is this is a recreation of sort of a, a, a typical uh, incident from from the game Battle Block Theater. <laughs> So there's one player has to throw the other player over the water, and then uh, the player who gets thrown over uh, can step on a thing to, to make a bridge appear. And it's just sort of too tempting to not, when the person is about to land on the bridge, make the bridge disappear again. It just, it sort of naturally happens. Uh, but also, they made sure that the consequences for that isn't too severe. And that was what we wanted to illustrate uh, in the clip. Then, then sort of inadvertently, uh, my Europe Kathleen also is going to stick the cat on here, which just added a little extra touch of the kind of inter joshing interaction that goes on within this game between the collaboration partners. And it's such a big part of what makes the game fun. Uh, if you didn't have this sort of uh, uh, getting smacked around, not directly by the other player, but by the other player uh, setting up things in the environment against you instead of for you, uh, this, this game would, would have very little value, I think. On the other hand, there are parts of the game that are extremely hard, timed levels that have much more advanced platforming and, uh, uh, and fighting with, uh, with monsters and so on. And what's interesting to observe is that the joshing just goes away then. Because when you feel the pressure from the game that we have to perform optimally, you do. So it's only in these sort of uh, grinding sequences where you know you're going to get through, there's no timer uh, ticking and so on, then, then it sort of automatically starts happening again. You, it just, you're, you're too tempted to take the bridge away or something like that. Oh yeah, so uh, I think there are relations also to, uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, I want to say Czech researcher, Jaroslav Zelch. Is he Czech? Yeah. 
that is doing uh, that's studying the the role of slapstick humor in games, and I think this is sort of a good setup for uh, for that kind of interaction to to occur. When when you have two people playing together, they they can sort of they're in a situation where they can reach those moments more than if you're playing against someone else, then you're more on guard. Uh, I think we can think of it in terms of uh, 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 in the cartoon Peanuts, where the character Lucy, there's this running gag of her holding uh, a football to make uh, Charlie Brown kick it, but she always pulls away the football right when he tries to kick it and he lands on his butt. So the reason she can get away with that is that it's framed as a co-op play experience. They're supposed to be on the same team. So uh, there is that sort of built-in trust of the framework. And it's that expectation of collaboration, that trust, that is the material that this kind of slapstick is built from. So uh, I think of it as sort of a, a, a rubber band of, of trust between the players that you can stretch and uh, it still doesn't break. Uh, in Charlie Brown's case, maybe it should have broken, maybe it shouldn't have trusted Lucy uh, for that many years, but I think it, between players they are always aware of that, okay, now I'm really pushing it, now I'm at the limit, now I have to be nice for a while, otherwise the, the, my, my partner won't want to play with me anymore. Uh, and then you sort of tone it down. And then when you've been nice for a while, you sort of build up some some, uh, some capital again in the trust fund, so so you can uh, you can play with it again and, and engage in some some slapstick humor. It can also be uh, built around, uh, uh, as the example was in Zelda, that you actually had resources or uh, something you're trying to get in the game uh, that gets counted individually. So if you have uh, a resource that doesn't matter who picks it up, it still goes to the team, uh, then you won't see as much sort of fighting over who gets there first, but often developers make some of those available in the game, but then there's also something, maybe something of less importance for getting through the game uh, that is sort of tagged for one or, or the other of the individual players, or it's just a resource that gets counted on their sort of personal account. And then you've built in this natural so adversarial component within the, the overall co-op structure. And I think, again, that's going to affect players' uh, way of playing differently. Uh, we were playing uh, a Ratchet & Clank four-player co-op game a lot uh, it, as part of this study when, when I was a resident scholar at, uh, at the Simmons Storm. And uh, some people just didn't bother about uh, picking up these individual resources, but uh, as one student uh, expressed it in an interview, uh, this game is, when she was asked if it was a collaborative game, she said, this game is 20% collaborative and 80% that's my box. So she was that kind of person who always wanted to get first to the treasure chests and so on. And it sort of became this role that, that not only she uh, utilized, but it got sort of played with among the, the other collaborators as well, that she, she was the, uh, the trickster, as I call it. Uh, she, she, sort of, she used the narrative of the game to, to uh, emphasize it. She, she picked the Dr. Nefarious character, which 
earlier in the Ratchet and Clank series used to be an, an opponent to Ratchet and Clank, the, the heroes of the game, but in this game he is on your team, but he does have this sort of shady uh, character about him still. Uh, uh, I want to show a clip from, from this game as well. So he is uh, the, the little purple guy and the big green guy is one of the through and through good guys of the team and uh, there's going to be a, a bolt coming up that the green guy can use uh, to build a new suit for himself but the purple guy has already picked up his bolt so he, he doesn't have a stake in, in this particular situation this is again a reenactment of something that happened in, in participant of observation. According to our geo scan, you're standing on top of some unstable ground. Try not to disturb anything as you make your way across. Yes. <laughs> By making the ground go away, that's, then he can get to his spot the minute he's trying. Yeah. <laughs> he's gonna try again. But... So the the informant that was uh, that liked to play Doctor Nefarious. Uh, even said things like so. Uh, at one point, one of the players in the team said, uh, "Hey, we needed that when Nefarious picked up the uh, health box that that wasn't needed for for that character." Uh, and the informant replied, "What? I'm the bad guy. Of course, I'm going to steal your health." <laughs> Which is very similar to the kind of lines that this character auto delivers in the game, uh, he says stuff like, what do you expect, I'm a super villain, and so on. So, she sort of took on the role to justify playing the role of the, of the trickster that she would enjoy playing in all kinds of uh, co-op games, not just this one. So, it's, there's a structure built in there by the developers that can be utilized in this type of role play. Uh, and it's, it's, again, she would never do something that made us not get through the game. She would only mess with stuff like it's sort of these optional additional goals and, and that kind of thing. Um, I would like to also talk about the, the third type of adversarial game player that, that uh, we observed in this study. And uh, this one I call the troll. So I think there's sort of a, a stage where trickstering turns into trolling. Uh, and it's basically when someone on the team starts messing with the team so much that they are actually failing to reach the shared objective in the game. Uh, And we had one of those as well, uh, among the uh, Simmons students. Uh, once again, this is a reenactment of uh, an actual event that occurred when they were playing, the students were playing this game. So, uh, so far everything is going well. This is a timed thing, so you're, you're in some kind of lab environment where there's a critter going through these uh, tubes 
and the creator has to get to the end and then you get a reward. So what we're doing is uh, we're running alongside and pushing buttons and stuff to make the tube uh, hold the whole way so, uh, so the creator can get to the end. So there we saw the uh, the troll uh, being a little mean by shooting someone into the electrical fence instead of up to the button where the person was supposed to go. But still, this was something that could be done. We were doing good on time, so that this didn't interfere with uh, fulfilling the overall objective. So here there are three final buttons to push, there's one, there's the second, and when they try to push the third button, the, the, the troll guy just shoots them off the ledge instead. So when they were trying to jump, when the first person couldn't do it, the second person tried to do it from jumping from the upper button to the lower, and he was there sort of catching them with his vacuum cleaning machine instead of shooting them off. And they kept doing this and being more and more annoyed, of course, that he would make them not finish. Uh, and probably getting pretty close to where they would have uh, decided to not play with him anymore. But uh, then another player entered, someone that he maybe was less inclined to, to be mean to, so then suddenly he stopped doing it. But I think either way, he would probably have attempted to push the players just as far as they he possibly could, and then to move back a little bit and say, "No, no, okay, I'm going to stop doing that." So the way I think of of trolling in this particular case, there are so many different types of trolling, is that he was playing a different game than the other players. I think the other players were playing the game designed by the developer, developers. He didn't find that interesting enough. He probably thought that it was a little too easy. So what he did instead was create this game where he's just manipulating the other players and seeing how far he can take them. Uh, the, the, the same uh, informant was also participating in it an event we, we had with the students uh, at Simmons where we were playing uh, uh, the Wii U game, Nintendo Land. And there's one game where you go around collecting candy from trees and uh, uh, there's I think up to four players that collect candy and then there's one player, the one that has the, the pad, that is trying to uh, make them not manage to collect the, the candy. So he runs around uh, chasing the people collecting the candy. He was one of the candy collectors and I think this is typical for the troll. The troll doesn't want to be the, the mean guy that the good guys are playing against. He wants to be in the camp of the good guys. But what he did was he, he made up uh, uh, this alternative strategy for candy collecting that was in the end, clearly suboptimal, but he managed to sell it so well that the other players were like, okay, let's do this instead. So instead of just trying to grab as much candy as possible, he said, let's go grab candy, put it in the middle, and then we have, when we have enough candy in the middle, then we'll all go there and grab enough candy to win the, win the level. And he managed to convince the other players of the team to try to do this, and they failed over and over again. And he, he was just very adamant that this is the strategy, I know this is the best strategy, and I'm really smart, so you should, you should listen to me. Let's just try it one more time. And again, I think he was just playing a different game. And in his game, the collaborators on his team 
were part of the gaming equipment. They were his pawns that he was trying to move around in the way he wanted them to move, not in the way that would be optimal for them to move. I think this can also be incorporated into uh, the design of a game. I think uh, with, there's been some work done here in the game lab, for instance, with subversive game design, where you design games that the players themselves don't know what the actual goal of the game is, and, and the goal actually becomes figuring out what the game is about. And I think it's sort of a twist on the, this sort of trolling mechanic, but it's sort of the game trolling the players instead, um, which I think is very interesting. I also wanted to take uh, some time and talk about uh, asymmetric representations and asymmetric gameplay in uh, co-op gaming. So these examples are from, from uh, mostly from console games, but I still think there are lessons to be learned here for any type of uh, co-op game design. Um, what I mean by asymmetric representations and asymmetric gameplay is uh, simply the fact that we're not dealing with just a palette swap type of uh, situation anymore where both players do the same thing and have the same goal. Uh, instead, uh, they are assigned different roles. They may be represented differently to the game system and on screen uh, to the other players as well. Um, Lego Star Wars uh, is, was sort of the, the beginning of the Lego franchise which uh, has become very popular and they've done a lot of games and uh, central to their model is the co-op aspect of these games. Uh, and there's a, there's a stated ambition from the developers to try to make games that you can play, for instance, with your children. So uh, they're utilizing one of these as unique aspects of co-op that I talked about before, that you don't really have to be uh, a, a match in terms of skills to have a good experience. If you're playing against each other and one player is much better than the other, it's no fun anymore. Uh, maybe the, in the parent-child situation, the parent has to pretend to be less good than they are, make the, let the child win, and that's sort of the most boring gameplay imaginable. Uh, so if you're instead on the same team, then that becomes less of a problem. Uh, I think, however, that there are issues involved in creating these uh, systems where we think of player one as the one who uh, is the real gamer, the one who owns the gaming experience, and the one who is allowed the most agency in games. And uh, in Lego Star Wars, we have an example of that. Uh, both players can perform the same type of actions and they have the same type of representation on screen. They choose uh, uh, an avatar from, from the movies uh, and play that uh, character in, as a Lego figure. But at least in these early Lego Star Wars games, it was only player one that uh, was uh, requested to log in to the Xbox Live system before playing. It was only player one that was getting the achievements for doing different things in the game. And also only player one that owned a save file from the game. So player two could not continue on on their own when player one wasn't around. 
then they would have to start the game over from the beginning. We can think of this uh, as sort of an invisible handicap to player two. Uh, and uh, uh, a, a problematic one, I think, because uh, games are often played in different ways than the developers expect them to be played. And it might be that uh, we're creating a formula for how this technology gets used that sort of premieres the, I assume, owner of the game. And often, if a family buys a gaming console, it's the son in the family that is the owner, even if the daughter pays as much on it. Situations like that, that, that can lead to, to, to results that, that are unfortunate. Another example, we're moving forward in time a little bit, is uh, the Death Spank game for uh, the PS3. Um, here we, we also had a representational asymmetry. So player one is a little blurry here, but player one is this character uh, called Death Spank, who is a big warrior kind of brawly dude. And uh, a lot of what you do in the game is collect new equipment. You, he, he gets better weapons, he gets more uh, items for his armor and so on. Then you can have a player two in the game as well. But player two has to play as Sparkles the wizard, this guy. And Sparkles doesn't get any new equipment. Sparkles also um, doesn't get any weapons, all Sparkles can do is heal that spec or use his fire spell to, to make some damage to, to the monsters. Sparkles also can't interact with uh, non-player characters in the game, so he can't get story, he can't get new quests and so on. Um, and he actually doesn't even get to ha have his own health bar, so um, if Sparkles get hit by monsters, it's taken out of this bank's health bar. <coughs> he also doesn't have any dialogue in the cutscene, so he, he's a very limited character. Uh, this is how a uh, reader of the joystick game site commented on the Sparkles character. The couch co-op is sadly really only a girlfriend thing. I can't see a fully fledged card carrying gamer being satisfied with playing as the second player Poof the Wizard or whatever his name is called. But seriously, my girlfriend loves it. No sexism, just my experience with it. Uh, so, first of all, yes, sexism. <laughs> this is what sexism looks like. And I unfortunately think that it was uh, helped along by how the, the, the game was designed. Uh, the, the term girlfriend mode was, was thrown around a lot when this game came, came out, mostly in positive terms, like game reviewers who tend to be male saying, finally a game I can play with my girlfriend and so on. Uh, but it wasn't, the term wasn't used by the developers themselves, and I think that's probably why it didn't get sort of picked up so much by, by, by media in a sort of in critical terms. Uh, another example of uh, limited uh, agency and representation in this case. So in Super Mario Galaxy, uh, player two doesn't even get their own avatar on the screen. So here player two is just represented by uh, this star where they point the cursor. And uh, what the, so player one is playing, playing Mario and is jumping around, jumping on, on, on enemies, uh, and so on. And what player two can do is collect these star bits that we see some up, up there, for instance, 
and then shoot them back out to stun enemies. There's also one sort of special double jump move that you can do by player two aiming at Morgan and clicking on him when he's done is the first part of the double jump. Oh yeah, player two can also point at enemies and sort of hold them down while Mario is running up and jumping up and so on. So I think it's, it's clearly in this case that, that Nintendo were thinking like this about player one and player two. And I think to, to definitely to some beneficial results because a, a lot of parents were saying that, well, this is the perfect game for my kid because they've gotten too old to think that they're actually playing when the controller isn't hooked up to anything. So there is that period in a child's development where they realize that the controller they're holding isn't doing anything to what's on screen, but they're still too young to really have the, the, the motor skills to <laughs> actually be part of playing these games. So I'm not saying that uh, there's, it, it's all bad to have uh, limited agency for, for uh, one of the partners in a co-op team and so on. I'm just saying that I think it's important to not make too many assumptions about how your game is going to be played because it might enforce stereotypes that we already know exist from, from other types of media where we have a male hero character that has most of the agency and most of the spotlight and then we have a female character that is mostly doing support, maybe doing some healing, some picking up berries and so on which I also have to do in because I've been playing player two through this whole study and it sort of becomes obvious that it's there, there are a lot of assumptions about me and who I am when I play these characters. Uh, I was never made to pick berries to, to create uh, healing potions before I played player two. And to my final example uh, in this rant, uh, in Borderlands 2, uh, there was a, a character uh, called Gage, the, the Necromancer, which was uh, uh, the fifth playable character in the game. She was available either uh, as, a, as a bonus for people who had pre-ordered the game, or as a paid DLC for people who didn't pre-order the game. Uh, Gage has a, a tech tree that leads to, not a tech tree, but, but a skill tree that leads to special abilities like one called near miss, for instance. Which makes, when she shoots but misses the enemy, sometimes she hits the enemy anyway. Uh, she also had uh, a, a, a very good uh, sort of, uh, it's partner that, that she can call forward that shoots for her so she doesn't have to do it. So, so basically she's made to be able to participate in gameplay even if she's not that good at the, at the game. Uh, oh yeah, I don't have a slide for the quote, but uh, Jonathan Hemingway, the lead designer for, for the game, said this in a Eurogamer interview. The design team was looking at the concept art this and thought, you know what, this is actually the cutest character we've ever had. I want to make, for lack of a better term, the girlfriend skill tree. I love Borderlands and I want to share it with someone, but they suck at first person shooters. Can we make a skill tree that actually allows them to understand the game and to play the game? Um, so uh, that sort of blew up in the media because he actually used the term girlfriend mode. And uh, the, the company came out and said that 
Well, actually, it's not called the girlfriend mode or girlfriend skill tree. We, we call it uh, the best friends forever mode. Uh, but I don't really think it's about the terminology we use. I think it goes deeper than that. I think just as in the death bank example, I think we have a lot of male developers that have a very limited perspective on who plays their games and how they play their, their games. And uh, I think it leads to these kinds of reproductions of stereotypes that are, are uh, very unfortunate. Uh, the media or games media was sort of divided on the issue though. For instance, in, in Venture Beat, Russ McLaughlin wrote, girlfriend mode is by its very nature inclusive. It doesn't tell anyone to shut up and go away. It's designed to bring people in, make them comfortable, that was my emphasis, and make it easier to participate. So, in a way, I think he has a point. I think there are a lot of girlfriends out there who are uh, watching maybe their, their boyfriends spend a lot of time play video games maybe on the main TV in the living room and uh, prohibiting them from doing much else in there than watching what's going on. And, Maybe they are happy that they get to somehow participate in this activity at least. Uh, but I think the problems are much bigger. I think this is a very sort of one-sided perspective on what games are and can be and how we utilize our technology and our living space. Uh, so. McLaughlin's argument here is that there are, uh, as he said, 72 million male gamers in the U.S. alone, and their girlfriends would have more fun in life if they became gamers. Uh, his description of how to do this led my thoughts to, let's see if I have a slide like this, this. So in, in uh, My Fair Lady and uh, in Pygmalion before that, we have this setup of uh, uh, the professor who is part of high society, and uh, he uh, he develops an interest for for this flower girl Eliza, and he has this exact mindset that if she was more like me, she would be so much happier. So there's there is a lot of value laid into this way of thinking that. Um, the community I belong to sort of is representing the best of all worlds. And people who don't belong to this community just doesn't realize how good we are or have it. So if they were just made into us, they would understand. And then uh, the whole movie is about making her behave in certain ways, making her talk in certain ways, making her appreciate certain things to become like him. Uh, and I, I think there's there's a, uh, there's a fear in me that we are trying to do the same within the games industry when we create these sort of gateway entry, gaming entry modes in the second player. We're trying to just recreate female gamers in our own image. And I don't think that it's necessarily true that games should be what they are now. I think maybe games need to be different to be more inclusive and fit more people's interests. And uh, uh, I think that the way to, to get there isn't just by sort of uh, restating the ideas that we already have about what gaming is. I want to end with a, a, a quote from Simone de Beauvoir from uh, her book The Second Sex from way back from 1949. Uh, I replaced uh, man and woman uh, to make it read 
Player one is not a natural species, it's a historical idea. Player two is not a completed reality, but rather a becoming. Um, what I think the Beauvoir is trying to tell us here through the ages um, is that we shouldn't take the current state for granted. A gamer doesn't necessarily fall from nature as exactly what a gamer is today. It's something that we have constructed. Um, and we shouldn't make snap judgments about what players need and want before we really see them. And I don't think we really are seeing the potential player choose yet within the industry. We need to think critically about our own roles as designers and try to be more uh, inclusive and support participation and spectatorship in different ways. Okay. Uh, that's what I had, and I'm happy to take questions. just about making women not suck at games. 
I think it hides a lot of problematic issues. For instance, why don't women already play games? Probably because uh, there are political and economical reasons of who gets to play games, who, who has the time to do it. I had stories from, from female gamers saying, I refuse to play co-op games because my brothers were so mean to me when we grew up. They, they, they didn't let me fail, they pulled the controller out of my hands. It's, it's a, an issue of even abuse and violence and sometimes that uh, excludes certain categories from certain gaming activities. And of course we have a lot of women playing games, but then they aren't always seen. And they are even less well represented among developers than uh, as players. So I think there are bigger issues that we need to deal with. And I still think that it's okay to have sort of introductory level experiences and uh, these kind of guiding experience where a more uh, experienced player helps others along. But I think we have to be very careful in how we frame them and what narrative we create around them. Yes. Um, more towards those kind of collaborative games rather than very competitive like, Yeah. So I think the, the quote we had here from the sort of the industry people, I, I I see some of it as being sort of a gatekeeper activity where they are trying to protect what they know and love as gaming, something that they have grown up with and become very good at, and that's maybe what we would call hardcore gaming or something like that. And they are very invested in other people who wants to play games and wants to enjoy games to be that kind of gamer, because that's the kind of games they want to play, make, write about and read about. So there, it becomes a, a problem if we have all these other new types of games that they almost don't even recognize as games. So there is this need to make others in the shape of themselves. So yeah, I think that's that's underlying. Well, there was a so since the week came out, Nintendo has been really um, stressing inter intergenerational play, especially yeah. in their advertising. Yeah. And that's what I always thought of as the Super Mario World style is that not necessarily player two is the child, but player two is the parent. Player two is a way for the parent who can who's not very good at, at the game, who can interact with, with their child and right. play the game with them. I think there's a particular age, I don't know exactly what it is, but I think there's an age where it switches where the kid gets good enough to control Mario. The kid, the, the parent can still play, you know, like yeah. with the left hand a little bit, but actually sort of focus on something else, but still interacting. But then they've, they've left that with um, Super Mario World 3D. Right. Uh, yeah, Super yeah. Mario 3D World. Yeah. Where everyone has this, everyone has the same advantage. There's a little bit of that in there. Yeah. No, I think the, the focus on who they expect to play that is. Oh, yeah, the, the commercial focus is that the parents are playing at the same level as, as the children. Yeah. So, it's, and I, I think it's interesting, I, I, player two in, in, in Super Mario Galaxy, for instance, I think it's an interesting sort of hybrid of spectatorship and actual gameplay. Uh, I also found that w when I was playing it with hardcore gamers, they, we were all switching out and hot seating Mario, but it was something to do while you were watching the others play. It was a little better than just watching. So uh, I think it's uh, I think it's a an interesting area to mine, but I also think you have to always be conscious about what kind of signals you're, you're sending out in your design. Um. I, uh, this made me think of something that happened when I was doing my uh, master's thesis work at Syracuse. 
and uh, I had people playing Gauntlet Dark Legacy together, like the, the 3D gauntlets that were on the yeah. GameCube, PS2, and stuff like that. Yeah. And I had, uh, they were in pairs, and it was usually uh, an intermediate or an experienced player and a beginning player. And I had one pair that was an intermediate and a beginner. Um, the beginner was a young woman, and so she wasn't, she didn't play games, and Gauntlet Dark Legacy is pretty unforgiving. Yeah. So she would die a lot, but then, she just turned, she transitioned really seamlessly from I am shooting things all the time to now I am your navigator, right? And it, it was really interesting to me how she kept playing, even though she literally did, she didn't have a literal controller in her hands, right? Like she set it down and was like, okay, now I'm going to watch the map, I'm going to identify things for you, I'm going to call it out, I'm going to mention stuff. And I, I actually, Someday, like do a little, a little more work on that. But I'm wondering how that fits into kind of the things you were talking about, right? This idea of going from literal participation in terms of I am controlling a thing that is inside the game to well, I died, but now I'm going to shift my desire to be part of the experience to things I can do in that space. And then, of course, if they made it through the level because she helped with navigating whatever, she gets came back, right? So. Yeah, I think the that sort of how I used to think like the, then it's great if we create a role for that type of player but what I'm starting to worry is if we put in sort of easy outs like that you're sort of excusing people to take the backseat role because what I found is uh, a, a lot of gamers say oh, I'd love to play with my wife but she just spins around shooting into the floor if, if I give her the controller when, when we play a, a, a first person shooter, for example. Well, that happens because the controller takes maybe an hour or two to get used to, but they've never gone past those first two hours, and maybe it all goes away. You know, that's what I found, that you really do suck to the point where you can't participate in a gameplay experience if you haven't held a, a, a controller before. But it goes away within a matter of hours. And often, I think, you don't push through those that sort of over that threshold if there is like, there's a way where you can play but you don't actually control your character, you're just shooting or, or something like that. So. I think we've sort of created a little bit of a bigger problem than it really actually is. Oh, so, so it seems like we're describing this kind of awkward moment in asymmetric game design where the asymmetry is kind of used to provide a player with reduced agency, but still agency. Yeah. But you talked about things like fire truck early on, which are these kind of like you're going to a space where you know you're going to play a game. Because like, I don't see that arc that kind of game being put in a laundromat, for instance, no. right? Yeah. Um, and uh, that's asymmetry. Yeah. But each person has a challenging role, and it's an interesting challenging role. And I'm wondering now that we're in a situation where multiple screens in the same room are common, you know, in the South yeah. and things like that, can we actually get back to the point where we can have asymmetrical gameplay where everyone has, in fact, vastly different roles in a way that player one can't do what player two is trying to do and player two can't do what player one is trying to do, yeah. but they need to cooperate. Yeah, uh, it's like Space Cadets, for instance. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with it. Well, the, the board game. Okay, I, I don't uh, it, so, I, yeah, I think it's, as I said, it's fairly uncommon with the, the forced collaboration that, that we see in, in, in the fire truck game, where, where you're actually controlling, in that case, the same vehicle. Uh, often, you're doing things on your own, but towards the shared goal, so it helps if the other player is good at what you're doing, but you can get through on your own. Uh, I think it's it, it's a really interesting interaction mode where where you're collaborating that directly. If what you're doing is feeding into what the next person is doing in a very direct way, uh, of course I, I think it's fine to have sort of simultaneous play, kind of, but not directly tied co-op games as well. 
but uh, I would I would like to see more of, of the the sort of enforced collaboration kind of scenarios. So I, I think those are interesting. And there is something though for for the non-enforced. So in the in the Forso fire truck, I, we, my wife and I tried to play when we went to the the arcade, uh -huh. and luckily we only tried once. Uh -huh. We'll still be together. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's there's a lot of um, back and forth communication that has to happen in order to, to coordinate really well to get that done. And you're given a lot of negative feedback for poor coordination and positive co and for good coordination. It's like okay, we're we're actually moving this truck down the road. Great, whatever. Um, kind of like in that co-op game or Ben Funny's yeah. games where it's like yeah. the fun is the failure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is a different topic of is the failure fun if it's two players and one's holding up the other guy back. But with um, the the GameCube Mario Kart game where you have two players operating the same cart, the player two is often um, in the like operating items while player one is driving and and, and maneuvering down the course. But there's some coordination that has to happen to get speed boost. So it's, there's a balance in, in positive and negative feedback going on with if we're if we're good together, we really see it on the screen and it's really awesome on the screen, but we're not when we're not good together, it's still okay and we're not gonna blame each other for, for being you know poor uh, poor driver or poor item fighter. Yeah, but I, I see a lot of uh, complaining from the player who is controlling the items about the driving of the Player is, is driving, which might end up with, well, why don't you just drive all the time? Then? Sure. But so, there's in fact a button, right? There's a button to swap them around. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So that happens. Oh, yeah, you're right, I did forget it. Uh, and yeah. I also wanted to stress that I don't think the, the fire truck game is a good game. <laughs> <laughs> I watched on YouTube clips and it looks horrible, uh, except for the, the bells and the, the horn. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I, I I think that's an interesting area to mine for interesting experiences. But of course, there's there is that thing that it really stings when you're collaborating and you get negative feedback. If you get negative feedback in a versus game, that's to be expected. Uh, but when you're trying to do something together and start complaining about each other, it can really hurt. So yeah, I think it's uh, uh, th there is that to be aware of. Is, it, is, it, is that kind of behavior characteristic of the community that plays games? Oh yeah, I, it's, I, I definitely think that uh, the so-called hardcore gamers are also... What good are these people? I mean, if they can't cooperate. I mean, uh, I mean, one one of these uh, one of the asymmetric qualities that you could develop yeah. is you know forget forget the game idea, but it, uh, uh, create scenarios around the solving of real problems where collaboration itself produces the outcome. Yeah, I think it's, well, this is this is a big question. But I think that if we had more games that were reliant on collaboration and maybe team collaboration, like in sports, we would see more development towards those kinds of skill sets. Because in a sports team, you know that you have to yeah. really perform together. And there are a lot of games that are like that, but I th still think that we have a legacy of the single player sort of gaming experience that a lot of people a little younger than me have grown up with where you you aren't rewarded for being nice to people to play with because well, uh, you're Philip, against them. Philip brought up a really wonderful concept the other day in terms of what it is in uh, someone like myself who's starting out to think about gaming and yeah. like design of games. The, the real ta the real tactic or the real goal right away is to find the fun, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that would be different for various kinds of people. Can you design a game in which you know be, uh, it actually recognizes for a specific kind of task different kinds of fun, so that you the team itself is uh, multi disciplined? Right. Yeah, uh, no, I think definitely. I think uh, that is that around. I mean, do those games exist. 
Oh yeah, I, I think so too. I can't pull an example out, out of my hat here, but uh, I think as, as, as soon as <clears throat> you start dividing team-based exercises into different roles, you also start to feel like, oh yeah, I'm the kind of person who will fit this role better than that role. And I personally think that that often leads to more interesting learning yeah. experiences. But I think that also happens even if if the rules doesn't say that we, we are supposed to have roles, like in soccer or something, you still design the roles for yourself because you, you recognize that that leads to a better outcome. So I'm the kind of person who has an easy time scoring goals, so I should be in their, their goal for most of the time. Can I ask one more uh, question? Sure. Uh, uh, this, is an I, this whole course is, is focused on uh, I, uh, iOS, the app. Uh, oh, no, 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 this, this is not part of the iOS uh, oh. uh, course. The iOS course is a separate uh, course. Being okay, in the iOS. Um, if you're, if, if the outcome of that course, the iOS, can I ask this question? Uh, I'm not sure if we can answer it, but but, but you're, 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 you're free to ask it. I just wondering if the iOS uh, environment for um, mobile apps mm -hmm. is um, uh, rich enough to support a multi-level collaboration that you know we're just we're talking about. Is that Oh, yeah. I mean, I have some perspective on that, but yeah, I but make yeah, no, a There's a game called Battlefield 4, and you can use an iPad as a commander panel right. to okay. drop some errors, right? right. The, the, I mean, the other thing about iOS, I think the big challenge with, uh, with iOS is that, for the most part, iOS is, I mean, it, it's on tablets and phones, right? These are devices that people have with them all the time, but when they're using them, they're not necessarily having their attention completely 100% dedicated towards it, you know. People might be looking at their phones while they're waiting for a bus to show up or something, right? They, they, you know, on the way, you know, walking We're down the hall car. or something like that. They're not as opposed <laughs> to a console game or a PC game where if someone sits down and plays that game, yeah. their attention is at least 80% on that game. Um, so when you're talking about a collaborative experience on a mobile platform, it is often, you have to think about it almost as a, um, What's the word asynchronous? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, is to see how you can support people's different schedules because um, they may be interacting with the game at different times of the day. Um, there are a couple of games that I've seen that do that well. Um, there are these strategy games where every turn can take hours or maybe even a day to execute. You know, I'm going to send my ships out, and it's going to take a day for them to reach the target, right? Um, and those tend to work. On one hand. It works well where you have lots of different people all logging into the game at different times because it's a slow paced game. But those games also have the nasty tendency to just take over your entire day because the game's always just running all the time. Um, so so uh, those could work on iOS, but they, they have design flaws that are unique to themselves. The, the synchronous version of that, Space Team? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, yeah. So, uh, it's again, it's one of those, it's a lot like Fire Truck, there's an enforced collaboration. Mm -hmm. You need to uh, pilot and repair your ship all at the same time. Each person has a different screen with varying um, controls on it. The controls, but on the top of the screen, it's saying, do this, do this, like discombobulate the confabulator or things like that. Uh, set the speed to five. You'll get a, a, a command that says, set the speed to five. You look at your screen, you don't have the speed control. Somebody else has the speed control. So you've got to say out loud to the other people who are playing in the same room, set the speed to five, but you've got four other people doing the exact same thing, yelling out loud what we need to do, what controls we need to do, and as you're playing, the controls are breaking. So it, like, there's times when the control just doesn't work, like that part of the control doesn't work anymore. So it's kind of taking advantage of making, trying to make a, trying to make that negative feedback fun again. It is, it is, it is a very well-designed uh, iOS cooperative, Synchronous. Yeah. It's, it's, this weird, it's a weird oddity that's actually very well designed. But yeah. it's so simple. At the, at the heart of it, it was a really, really simple mechanic that works so well. You know, it's almost like, why didn't I think of that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But technically, it's difficult to actually play. Um, just having four people in the room with the same device, with the same, um, with the game installed on the same wireless network, or using Bluetooth, 
Um, there's still just a lot of just technical barriers that just make that they don't make it as easy as on a console picking up controller number two and looking at the same screen. Well, it's a good uh, glimpse of where it could go. Yeah. Apple demonstrated uh, what beacon yesterday. Mm -hmm. Now, would, in, in a situation like that, uh, would it could beacon identify people in the vicinity who might be willing to join? I don't know if it has enough bandwidth for that, but possibly. But that's that kind of. Yeah, the, 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 it's, we're just not there yet technologically, but we're going to get there at some point. Yeah. yeah. How about Nintendo's Street Pass? I mean, that's kind of interesting as well, right? Yeah, yeah. but I'm always on Nintendo. But that tends to be other people become my random disposable resource. Yeah. I mean, like I'm playing a uh, game <laughs> per se. Well, I'm, I'm playing a demo for a game that's going to come out soon called Bravely Default. And one of the things they give you is like a Farmville no. All they have is discussion. <laughs> One of the things that they, they give you to do in the games is kind of Farmville-esque. Hey, do you want to buy a new sword? This thing in your little town sells swords, but you have to send people to build it first. And the more people you street pass, the more faceless serfs you can now send to be your feudal minions to build your house that sells swords, right? So. It's one of those things, right? They had, one of the games built into the 3DS for street passing is, hey, I've been kidnapped. I need a whole bunch of heroes to come save me, and random people you meet are. Do you like yellow? Do I like yellow? Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you a yellow person if you bring your 3DS to class. I don't, I don't know. This got weird. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting. That's an interesting take on enforced on enforced collaboration. With enforced collaboration, you don't. No one needs to give their consent to collaborate. No one needs to do anything to collaborate other than turn street pass on. But they're technically collaborating in the same sort of way that I can visit your farm um, farm build and water your crops or fertilize <laughs> your things, and it's like, um, it's 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 unnecessary. Yeah, I, I think it's so weak, it's, it's not really that in, interesting as a mechanic, but to me at least. I, I think there should be something on, on the line for, for everybody involved, too. Uh, and I, yeah, so that, that's why Space Team is, is so good to me, because then I think it's the collaboration that's the core mechanic of that game. It's not pushing buttons, it's actually the, the shouting between people, so it's not even in the game. It's What about the trolling you talk about doing bad things to another player? Yeah. Uh, what what's the relationship between the game the game the player in the game and uh, real life? Or were they the same kind of person in real life that do the tricks? Yeah, yeah, that's stuff? In interesting. Uh, as I mentioned with the the troll, uh, he would be very different depend even inside of the game depending on whether we were sort of doing something really hard in a game. We, we played the board game Pandemic on the hardest difficulty and we were failing and failing and failing and he never did anything to, to make us fail because it was, the, the game was putting up enough resistance for him. It's like when he gets those extra brain cycles over when the game isn't engaging him completely then he starts scheming and thinking of <laughs> this evil master plans uh, he was the nicest guy possible outside <laughs> gaming in real life so I don't know maybe he schemes with his friends like when he gets bored or something but uh, uh, not with me but I uh, mean I, I was a scholar, resident scholar so it was a little bit Uh, what are your thoughts on modern slot game uh, design for cooperative play? Don't know that much about it, uh, to be honest. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I don't really, I don't have a take. Okay. Would you like me to maybe explain how that works? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the uh, way slot machines work now these days, they'll have uh, different themes. So they'll set a bank of machines together, like a bank of five or ten machines. They might have something based on Wheel of Fortune or a uh, game property like the uh, Big Buck Wild Hunt. And they might set up something similar to what people have a trace for. And usually when you get to hit a bonus game, you do that in a single player. So one person's playing, they hit the bonus game, lights go off, all the magic all happens. But they have now communal bonus games. 
And with communal bonus games, that means the entire bank machines, depending on a certain number of players getting uh, achievements as they're play, uh, rolling through the, the machine, they all get to participate mm -hmm. and make a lot of money to split between themselves. Uh, so despite the fact that uh, slot machines aren't based on skill, they have chance, but they have a lot of ways to make this very social interaction for not just people playing, but for everybody watching. So like what the Glee said, Big Buck Hunt. You, uh, you've seen like the arcade machine where you have two giant guns and yeah. you're shooting. Now imagine you're sitting down in like a lounge chair and it's a wide screen and you have the gun next to where you'd be playing for the video slot machine. So now the bonus game comes up where both of you now have to take the guns out and shoot stuff on the screen. Mm -hmm. And that, and depending on what you get within a certain time period is the, the amount of money you get. Mm -hmm. And you can unlock more bonuses or different things. There's like multiple variations of how that works. Right. That's melding with my image of who plays slot machines in Vegas. <laughs> so I'm just seeing a ton of, a ton of tiny blue haired, hunched over old women with a crate of quarters that are suddenly busting like, take this! Turning into like, hey, <laughs> FBS man shooter dude browse for 10 seconds to make sure that they're getting a lot of payout. That, sorry. That's off topic, but I thought you would all enjoy that mental image. So, so let, let, let me get this straight. It, it, it's almost like automated social interaction with the people who are playing the same game but on a different machine. Yes. Uh, but they've been networked somehow and if you are both playing the game at the same time, suddenly there will be these moments where both of you are trying to cooperate to a shared goal. Yes. So like there might be like uh, Wheel of Fortune. Mm. There might be certain times you collect certain letters mm. to unlock new bonuses. And then within a time limit, if other people in that bank of machines do that, everybody gets that, and then you pretty much play Wheel of Fortune. Mm. And they have like a real screen up there, and you're like picking the letters and all that stuff. And depending on who solves it first, they get the most money. Mm. All right. So is that based on skill, or are you saying chance? Well, the, well, I guess, I guess uh, oh, sorry. Uh, that one actually, a letter and then it gives you a certain amount. It's already like preset. You're just like picking the space and then it'll be like, okay, these are five of these. Mm -hmm. Or you pick the space or this one's uh, constant. It's not uh, not in the sense like you're physically putting in the letter. True. But whoever selects the most will make the most money. It seems to me that that's mostly designed for social goals, right? To sort of bring the, to sort of end enhance the relationship that you have with the people next to you in the same space uh, rather than strictly a gameplay goal but of course the game the game rules are enforcing that right that is like all of a sudden you have to be aware that you're right next to other people you know, whereas previously when, when you started the game you, you may not have needed to and and that seems uh, that I think is just a, a, a nice recognition that these games are being played in a social space. You know, the, 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 a, a poker table or, or a blackjack table is already understood to be a social space. It, it's, it's a circle of people that are playing with each other, uh, even though they're individually playing in, 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 in individual games, or at least, at least in blackjack you are. Um, and that just seems to be taking that same, that, that same idea into the digital space. Um, you know, the fact that you don't have a group yet, but you have a computer that can sort of facilitate that says, hey, all of you are interested in the same sort of interaction, so let's all play together for a little bit of time. Um, and maybe that gets you to stay around, because that's one thing that MMOs you know, struck gold partly because they discovered that it's not the game that necessarily keeps you around, it's the people that you play with that, 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 right. that, that keeps you around, and that seems to be maybe a, an attempt to sort of... Uh, to keep you at this game, even if you might be getting bored of the game, you may not be getting bored with the people next to you. Well, actually, it kind of makes me think. I wonder, like, imagine adding a, a, a goal outside the game, like, like making money, for example, in slot machines. And I wonder how that may change the dynamic. You know, if there's some realization of a goal, again, that's outside of the game itself, you know, obviously money is something that comes to mind, uh, given the discussion on slot machines. But I wonder how that might actually affect the players? Are there uh, any studies on that? There are actually, um, mostly in, in the motivation space. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's difficult to introduce any kind of reward that doesn't become part of the game and become the reason why you're playing that game. So once you introduce money, quickly becomes the reason why you're playing that game and the main, re and the main way in which you measure your uh, 
accomplishment and your interest in playing that game is, is you know, it's going to be directly connected to that, to that money. There's a couple of good papers I can probably recommend, but that might be a one-on-one -on -one discussion. Here. I wonder if that would impact the number of trolls in a game. Like, would you be less likely to troll if you knew there was a monetary reward, for example? Oh, not as evidence has proven that people love to troll people <laughs> in real market <laughs> yeah. transaction games. Yeah, well, it's, it seems to be hard to get uh, what's best for all of us is best for you kind of prisoner's dilemma outcomes. But it doesn't have to have real money in it for that. I mean, there are games that are sort of built around that mechanic, like Payday the Heist, for instance. Like, you're doing a heist together, but at some point you might turn the guns to your partners and get more money for yourself. And, Surprise, surprise, people will shoot their partners. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, so they did a, there's a study with the prisoner's dilemma, and they, they were studying the framework that was put in. If I told you you're playing a Wall Street game, prisoner's dilemma happens like we know it happens, like they screw each other over. We tell you it's a collaborative game, they help each other out. Mm -hmm. And that just setting that framework is a huge, huge um, initial thing you can do as a designer. But like what you were saying earlier, though, like the, the trolling, I mean, that's just human nature. There's something about that that just happens. That it's not the game, like, like they're, they're taking elements from the game, but the way you describe it, so they're right. using the game to excuse the behavior that they want to do in that, in that, in that period of time. Yeah. 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 Well, is, is Grand Theft Auto played only by trolls? Uh, no, it's most. I mean, it's hard to troll. <laughs> it, it, really? It's hard to troll anybody if it's a single player game. There's no one that you're trolling. Yeah, no, no, but, uh, are you thinking about the, the multiplayer online yeah. version? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, guys, huh? I mean, so I, I mean, I just asked you. No, just just cause is the. <laughs> I, I, I would say just cause is the game for a lot of people who are interested in kind of grand type auto interactions, but love to see how to screw around with the system. <laughs> um, but because they're all in it together, it's hard to call them trolls anymore. No. Yeah. Because yeah. because now they're actually cooperating towards. A, these ridiculous random, random goals. Really weird it, this yeah, just cause is, the, uh, is a, it's a physics sandbox type game where you've got a grappling hook and you can grapple things together. So I can take that plane that's flying by and attach that to that car that's driving on the ground. And somebody might be inside of that car and somebody might be attached to that plane. And once that connection happens, crazy things happen with the, with the physics. It's, it's a world full of Chekhov's guns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to emphasize, though, uh, Lisa Nakamura gave a really great talk at the Association of Energy Researchers Conference uh, in October in 2013 about this idea of trolling and uh, especially how we kind of need to move past it, which I think is, is a thing we do need to do. Uh, we talk about trolling sometimes as if it were this elemental thing that we can't do anything about, right? And um, that it's just a thing that happens, right? Like if somebody says something awful on the internet, we're just like, oh, well, they're just trolling, right? And, and it kind of gives that person and their behavior an easy out. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think she put, if not the entire talk online, then at least a good summary um, of, of reframing, reframing trolling more towards actual purposeful decisions that people make that are enabled by or encouraged by particular systems, mm -hmm. and I think that that has that has an impact and uh, relevance to multiplayer. Yeah. I, I want to say though that trolling can mean so many very different things. So I think what she was talking about is different than what I'm talking about. And there's a, uh, I'm blanking on his name now, but there's a good, very good paper on sort of trying to define all the different types of meanings trolling has. Well, the uh, you're saying that trolling goes away, though, as the stakes increase for the, uh, for the population? Right. For this particular subject, I, I, I don't know how much I want to generalize about this, but just in this, this is a very sort of early observation in this study. Uh, for him, it did. It was clearly uh, related to um, 
needing to find more excitement going on that uh, it started coming up. Yeah, I, uh, I'm struck by, uh, in all of these discussions, how much uh, what's happening in the game world actually is mirroring what's happening in the real world. You know? Right. And uh, how close are, you know, everybody talks about convergence. Is there something happening to, you know, uh, in the game world that might inform the real world? And vice versa, as the, as the technology and the uh, the research about gaming, right. you know, gets more sophisticated. That's a big question. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, trolling is. I mean, you know, trolling. Yeah. Which may be a natural thing, but it could in fact become an example of fun, fun. And if it, you know, because it's natural, you know, yeah. it's a natural thing that gives pleasure. And uh, if it can be, you know, somehow harnessed. Or some effect. I mean, I, I mean maybe just I can, cause as a, just cause trolling. Yeah. Just design that game. Maybe I can answer like this. That I think we need to move away from, and I think we are on our way away from the whole. It's just a game kind of justification of what is going on between people in games because. It's real people interacting with each other. It has real outcomes. If, if if you do mean things to someone else in the game, you're doing mean things to that person anyway. So yeah, I, I think that's something that when gaming went online and we started to have these person-to-person interactions much more in games, there was a period where where we were confused and thought that. It didn't really happen because it was inside of the frame of the game. But, but yeah, I, I, we're still real people. Is that what your research, research is looking at? I mean, what, what, what's, what are you, what, what, what are you looking for? Well, I'm, I'm interested in the players more than the games. Yeah. Uh, to, to try to understand them, and but of course I want that to inform game design to have us avoid the kind of pitfalls I was talking about and maybe find interesting uh, aspects to mine for, for game design as well. So that's, that's where I'm at. I think there's a answer in the I'm not giving a talk, by the way. I think there's a trust issue too, right? Uh, in the days of board games and pre-online, well, okay, today's are technically still the days of board games, but like before online capable consoles and mass online computer gaming were a thing. Generally speaking, if you were playing a game, you had some sort of, even if minimal, social tie with people around you, right? The possibility for us to be having multiplayer gaming scenarios with complete strangers on a regular basis is a product of the modern era. And if I'm playing a game with a friend, and that friend makes a dick move or a joke at my expense, I have a pre-established relationship with that person, so I know that they're not necessarily trying to cause me harm. If some online jerkwad does it to me, I don't, I don't know, right? Are they attend, uh, you know, to them, because I have no shared way to know what their orientation towards the activity is compared to mine, right? And I think that you have to keep those, those differing situations in mind, right? Are we talking about people who are now dealing with strangers where they have no social framework or expectation about that person's behavior? Or is it a person where I know them, and so I can rely on my established relationship with them to soften the blow of anything they do that is not necessarily for my benefit or for the group benefit of the players? There's a genie here. <laughs> There's a bunch of genies that all of this stuff is about to unleash. I think I think they're out. Uh, no. <laughs> there are no cats in any bags right now. I would say. Uh, okay, so um, thank you very much to... Uh, to <laughs> we'll take a short break. Um, I, I, I do want